Good morning, church. We are in part three of the strange and wonderful world of our scripture. And by now, many of you are already quite uncomfortable. And I get that. I really do. I grew up as if, nobody ever told me this, but as if a big black leather bound book fell down from heaven with a note in it said, good luck. This is it. This is all you've got. In fact, we were so solid on this that we didn't even believe the Holy Spirit did anything except speak to us through the written word only. That was it. No other guidance didn't indwell within us or the like. Now, that's rather extreme, but most Christians have some version of that in them, that the Bible is almost iconic to the point of being a, um, an equal with God in its perfection and the like. And the arguments behind that get very thick and heavy. And then whenever you run into a wall where something you've read in the Bible doesn't jive with something else you read in the Bible, or it doesn't seem to work in your life, or you find that there's a science thing or an experience thing that throws your understanding to the side, that's a struggle. But what you need to know is it's also normal it's supposed to happen. Faith is not supposed to be handed to you and you accept it as is and then hand it on to the next generation. Some parts of our faith will remain the same forever. But other parts need to be, and here's the big scary word in Christianity, deconstructed. We need to ask the questions we've been asking on Mondays for three years now, and that is, who told you that? Or who told you about? And question question, question, but always open to hearing answers. So part three, we're ready to go. As soon as we start ta talking about our Bible and taking a hard look at our Bible, we get a very fair and honest question. What do we do with 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17? If you don't know it, you should. It's, it's a great passage. The scripture says, and this is the NIV of 2011, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All right. Now, the NIV uses is useful for teaching. Oh, and, and scripture is God-breathed. Most versions will say inspired. The word means the same thing. Inspire. Uh, respiratory is, is that part of the last bit to breathe into scripture. And Christians have often assumed that meant that God dictated scripture and that writers were just secretaries, but that does not hold up. And if you've not figured that out yet, you're going to figure that out in this series and there's going to be some deconstruction. But I must assure you of something. While it seems that most of the books and the YouTube videos and the like about this deconstruct, and that's it. Our point here is to deconstruct so that we can then construct a stronger, more robust, more accurate, and effective faith, and still centered around that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We can get there, but we have to build on this. So I hope that you work with us. You go through this, read the notes. They're in the comment section. You can, uh, or the description box, rather, and, and work with us on this. And when you have questions, send them in, info at rsafeharbor.com. A lot of times we may say, hold on, the answer to that one's coming in an upcoming sermon. But if it's not, we will deal with your question right there. I don't want us to get bogged down into the weeds of translations and how translations are done. We will be doing that later in this series and especially uh, in a side series on our Monday morning that will go along with a lot of this. But for now, you need to be aware that you cannot translate word for word any language from one to the other. It cannot be done. It doesn't matter whether it's Spanish English or whether it's Biblical Greek to French. You cannot go word to word. And because of that, interpretation and theological hard work and some assumptions always come into play. 
But look at this passage again. And then realize that the word is, is not in the earliest manuscripts we have. It changes everything. So you would read all scripture, all inspired scripture is useful. Instead of all scripture is God breathed, it's all God breathed scripture is useful. Well, that changes everything about the way you read it. Uh, other translations, there, there is is there, but it's placed after the, the phrase. So it would read, all scripture that is inspired by God is useful. That's very different. And I would just suggest to you that with this variety in our manuscripts from the first several hundred years, uh, well, we don't have them all from the first uh, at all. Talk about that in a bit. Our oldest manuscripts have it three different ways. But the least common way is the way you probably memorized it. All scripture is inspired by God. That's the least common. And it's the oldest, uh, it's the youngest, let's put it that way. The others came before it. So don't hang your hat on this passage. Respect it, read it, figure out what it's really saying. But don't build your entire skyscraper upon this little foundation. It would be a problem. And there's something else you need to realize here. When Paul wrote this book, there were very few books out there that would make it eventually into what we call the New Testament. He wasn't talking about the New Testament. He was talking about the Old Testament. Because that's the only scripture he had. While he was writing books that would later be looked upon as scripture, there are indications that Paul did not expect that to happen with his books, except in certain passages. He would then say, this is from the Lord. And then other times he would say, this is not from the Lord, but from me. And then there would also be very personal missives here or things about that. It was obvious that some things he wrote, he considered scripture or at least authoritative. But when he wrote this passage, all scripture is inspired by God or all scripture which is inspired by God, um, he was talking about the Old Testament because he was really our first writer other than perhaps the book of James and maybe the book of Mark. That's in great doubt. In fact, our first books in the New Testament were James, 1 Thessalonians, Galatians, 2 Thessalonians. And these things are happening about the time he's writing this. But he's not talking about those. So once again, some caution about the way we speak of this. Also, this brings us to another point, which we looked at in a Monday morning message back in April. I was told all my life that we were a New Testament church. And what that meant was that we had reestablished the worship, the organization, the plan of salvation of the early church. And that we got that by reading the New Testament. It was only later in life whenever I found out how the New Testament was put together. And more important to this discussion, when that it hit me, wait, the New Testament does not give us the church. The church gave us the New Testament. Athanasius made a, uh, a list of the books that we currently call scripture. And he said these are commonly accepted. He had a couple of variations in there that we don't have, but it was it's good enough. Erasmus, years and years later, would say, here are the commonly accepted ones. Here are the ones that are in dispute. Here are the ones that are right out. We don't, we don't think these are in. And interestingly enough, he has the book of Revelation in the commonly accepted and in the disputed column, uh, which shows you how long it took for Revelation to work its way into the book. And it was only in the 1500s that some of the books that we now call the Apocrypha made their way out of Bibles. 1500s. And when Paul wrote this to the church in Thessalonica, or Thessalonica, it means there was already a thriving group of believers without one book of the New Testament having been written. And they weren't alone. Thriving groups of Christians were everywhere without one book of the New Testament being written. Which shows you once again, it is the church that brought us the books. 
The books didn't bring us the church. And that opens up a whole lot of other questions. We're going to be asking those. Not today, just planting the seed today. We also have to factor in that if you say everything that Paul wrote was inspired, then why don't we have it? There are a lot of things Paul wrote we don't have. He talks, for example, in Corinthians about two other books. One that he had written before 1 Corinthians and another that he had written in between 1 and 2 Corinthians. So if you really want to get pedantic about it, we have 2 and 4 Corinthians. We don't have 1 and 3. What's the answer to that? Well, the answer I was always given when I asked this as a young man was, if God wanted us to have it, we would have it. I admire that kind of faith. But I have to ask you, is that an honest response? Isn't that an assumption? That if we, God wanted us to have the book, we would have the book. I believe in the power of God, and I believe in providence, and I believe that he has already given us all we need. In fact, these people were already Christian and already bound for glory before any of the books were there. So I don't think you can use the, well, God gave us the right books to get us to heaven answer here. He gave us the right person in Christ. And this is our community story. But we'll get there. It's so hard for me not to race ahead. Why should you take entirely on faith that we have all the books we need, that these books are done, no more books are going to be written, and that all the books that are out are out, and all the books that are in were placed in by God? Why would you take on faith that that had happened when God never spoke about any of that? And in fact, as I pointed out one time, and it was not a pleasant day because questions were not welcome when I was growing up. I saw a painting of the Council of Nicaea. Now, the Council of Nicaea did not randomly pick the books of the New Testament and lock them in. That's a myth. But they did codify before Emperor Constantine that these were the books that Christians accepted as legitimate authoritative books. So they didn't do what they're said to have done, but they did something important there, was saying these are our books. Um, and I saw the painting. And the painting, all of them had on the pointed hats. Uh, Catholics, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I don't know the names of the different parts of uh, priests and cardinals and bishops attire. And they had had the shepherd's crooks and they had all of this other. And I said, we say clergy are not, we don't, we say, in fact, there aren't, there aren't clergy that, you know, the ministers are among the common people. We say that putting on special clerical garments is wrong. We say calling yourself a bishop over many churches is wrong. And, and don't even get us started on cardinals and popes. You say that we are not supposed to walk around with bells, books, and candles, and a, and a shepherd crook, and yet you're accepting what they tell you are the scriptures. Why would you accept that? That was an awful day. I was called a lot of things that day. Uh, I was grounded that day. It was a bad day. It's a legitimate question. Why these books, and what are these books? And the what are these books is what I want to look at for the rest of today. Whenever we get past all of this and look at what Paul actually said in these verses, he said they were useful and profitable and for you to be smart in the way you divide them. Divide them? Yeah. Into this is of God. This is just our community story. We learned better than this. Yeah. We're going to prove that today. Hang in there. I know you're uncomfortable. I can't believe how uncomfortable I was for years going through this. But I hope that you can see as a testimony that I'm standing here in front of you today as a man of faith who has given my life to the story of Christ. And who, even though I'm past retirement age, I don't plan to retire ever as long as I have strength and the ability to tell people about Jesus. So somehow I got here even after the deconstruction, I'd love to take you with me and maybe make your journey a little bit less painful than mine was and that many of our journeys have been. When he said they're useful, when he said they're profitable, 
He didn't say they were inerrant. Now the word inerrant means whatever the person using it says. Most people think it means that every word in the Bible comes from God and that every date given is absolutely correct. Every historical thing absolutely happened as described. Every scientific natural phenomena happened exactly as described and on and on and on. That is not what theologians think when they use that word. They have many different definitions of it. Even the famous or infamous, uh, according to where you come on the question, Chicago statement on the inerrancy of scripture, which is looked upon as one of the most conservative, hardcore statements, says not everything is to be taken as literal. Even they say, you got to divide. You've got to be careful. Not every number, name, situation in Scripture happened exactly as stated. Or you would have to believe a lot of things. One, all the kings reign around 40 years, and, uh, or exactly, and that you've got 3,000 baptized, not 2,999. You see my point? Allow them to use synecdoche. Allow them to use hyperbole. Allow them to use language and what they knew and when they knew. Well, where did our idea of inerrancy come from then? Came from, started really in Britain, but it blossomed and grew in America in the 1800s. And it was called then and today fundamentalism. And the fundamentalist movement gave birth to the evangelical movement. The evangelicals, generally speaking, are not as hardcore as a fundamentalist, but they're off that same branch. It turned a lot of things into doctrine forever for the church that hadn't been before. No early writer, or uh, for our Catholic friends and, and brothers and sisters, um, none of the early church fathers spoke of the scriptures as being inerrant. Not a one. That is a modern idea, comparatively speaking. Before that time, scripture was seen as an unfolding story, a narrative that pointed us to Jesus, the word of God. We were led to him. We were his community. And the Bible is our community story. We love our Bibles. But like all community stories, there are parts of that story we don't want to hear. We don't want to hear about the racist laws that were passed in America, not only against African Americans, but specifically in California, all the way up through the early 1900s, up through the Second World War, against Chinese, against the Japanese, and the horrible things said in the laws passed in California against those people, and there was even a law f to stop the migration of any Chinese into our, our state. Yeah. Do you, do you like that story? I don't like that story. That's a shameful episode. Locking up the Japanese during World War II, as Franklin Delano Roosevelt did, that's shameful. Community stories have things in there we wish weren't there. But they're there. They also have stories in there that differ according to who told them. The stories in Samuel and Kings are not the same as the stories in Chronicles, even though they're supposed to cover the same people. The outcomes are different. In Kings, you learn about David's adultery, his treason and murders and all, and the rebellion of his sons, all of that. In Chronicles, none of that happens. <laughs> it's according to who's telling the story. I, I understand this because it means our stories will vary, but we still love them. We think they're valuable, profitable, and they're holy. My mother's stories about me, I would always just kind of look at my wife and go, I, I don't remember any of that. In my mother's stories, I was always more clever. I was always a better person. I was always you know, far more mature than I remember me being. And while I appreciate that she looked at me that way, those stories sometimes took me to places I was pretty sure I'd never been. I had a sister named Pamela who's passed away years and years ago now who would say, oh, I remember when, and she would tell a story that I'm absolutely certain didn't happen. But did I, you know, shame her or the like? No. Allow people to have their stories. The Bible is a community story. Now take what we've learned so far and think for a moment. Since Paul's books were among the very first books 
in what we call the New Testament. Again, that means vibrant Christian communities were thriving without a New Testament. How do you do that? There are no books to guide you. Well, I asked that question too. That was another bad couple of weeks. They, I was told, well, the apostles traveled around to make sure that everybody was on the same page and doing the same thing. That's a great answer, except we have zero evidence that that ever occurred. There's no written evidence in scripture or outside. There's no historic evidence that we can find anywhere to indicate that. And in fact, in Acts chapter 15, when Christians gathered at the mother church in Jerusalem, they, they were very, very, very different in what they thought about uh, Gentiles, the old law, how much we were to be more like Jews or less like Jews, how we worshiped. Those things were very, very different. And they were sent away with no guidance other than don't act like the pagans and leave each other alone. They weren't told, well, there are going to be some books written. Just like Jesus didn't say, all authority under heaven and earth has been given to some books which are going to be written over the next hundred years, and then they'll be gathered over the next 200 years after that, and you guys won't get to read them, but somebody will have them eventually. He didn't do that. He said, all power and authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, to Jesus. And so these Christian communities thrived long before there was a New Testament. Be careful that we do not give sweet little answers like the apostles must have traveled around to make sure everybody was on the same page. One day you're going to look down and realize you built a skyscraper on a cobweb and your foundation's going to go. And it's going to be a painful fall. So let's not do that. The good news of Jesus existed and was powerful and was changing the world long before the New Testament was, was gathered together. It's the story that is important. That is the river in which we are immersed. It is the river that sweeps us along with the Holy Spirit's power and guidance into the presence of God. In the old days, when you got a GPS unit, now global positioning satellite, today we have them, but we call them phones. And they're everywhere. But back when these were first issued, your unit had to hit three satellites to triangulate your position. And it gave it to you in numbers or a very rough map. In fact, for the first generation or so of these, they would, uh, they would not even light up the screen unless they found all three satellites. And so I tell people, I need three arrows to align before my screen lights up and I go, okay, okay. What would it be? Our community story, what we call scripture, nature, in other words, what I can see, what I can experience, what I learn from science or from just life, what I learn when I look up at a night sky, what I learn when I look through a microscope, and then community. Because nobody knows everything. With the skill set of the other two employees here at our safe harbor, uh, full time, we have a couple part time that help out. Uh, their skill sets are completely different than mine. There's no Venn diagram, there's no overlapping. That's the way God made us, and we need the community thinking to keep us straight. So that if Patrick gets a weird idea, uh, like Charles Russell did back in uh, around 1900 and start declaring, well, the cross is really a torture stake and I really know what the Greek meant and nobody else did. Then somebody can get around Charles Russell and say, stop that, you're out of line, that's not correct. And he wouldn't have started his denomination. We need the community, nature, and our community story. And then we can get started stripping away the layers after layers after layers of fundamentalist preconceptions. It might be painful, but think about this. Why does the Bible say certain things unless this is what we're supposed to be doing? In Isaiah 1 and verse 18, I turned too far, here we go. Come now, let us settle the matter, or generally translated, let us reason together, says the Lord. When I was younger, I asked what this verse meant. 
as you can probably determine by now, I asked way too many questions and I didn't ask one out of a hundred that were in my head. They said it meant that when we brought our issues or questions to God, that he showed us his wisdom and that he was right. But is that then honest for him to say, come, let us reason together? Let us work on this together instead of saying, sit down, shut up, and listen? I, it seemed a tortured explanation to me. And then reading in Matthew 18, 19, um, by the way, just an aside, I've, I've more than once been accused of not believing my Bible and had to say, but I'm actually reading it. Have you seen this? And showing people what it is. And it's fantastic, but it's not what people have said it is. And by the way, I'm not alone in this. There are vast numbers of people who know it in their heart, but don't have a platform to speak of it. So let's open up to this. In Matthew 18 and verse 19, again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Well, that's a very inconvenient verse. What does it mean? It seems that God's main desire is that whatever we do, we do as a group, as a community, that we agree upon something, that we're not in conflict. What we're agreeing about, he doesn't even talk about. It's, it's more like just get along rather than get along by following these 15 precepts. Now, plainly, God will not go against us if we go against something plainly forbidden throughout our community story or if it's against nature, or, you know, that sort of thing. He, won't, he will not help us overthrow the government. He will not help us rob a pizza place. He will not help us decide to enslave our neighbors. God's not going to approve of any of those things. He has shown us what he thinks about robbery and violence and kidnapping and the like. But the things that divide us aren't those. The things that divide us are interpretations of scripture, the findings and the pronouncements of our religious leaders. Jesus said, unity. But religious leaders have spent their entire lives making sure that never happens. I love Philippians 4, verses 2 and 3, where Paul tells Yodia and Syndike, two ladies there that he highly esteemed, to agree with each other so that the work can go on and God be praised. He didn't say who was right. Because that wasn't the issue. The issue is just get along, make a decision, and do it for God. As scripture says, whatever we do, do it as unto the Lord. It doesn't tell us everything we're supposed to do and what we can't do. We cannot change the character of God by our judgments or our agreements. But he chooses to work collaboratively with us. And we see him do that. Yes, we see him adjust even in scripture. For example, the year of Jubilee. If you don't know what it is, look that up later. An amazing concept. And I wish it was a worldwide continuing concept. Given as law. And yet there is never an example of it ever happening. Even in scripture. Much less in history and the documents, and the stones, and the, the carvings we've, driv- we've, we've dug up. Not one example of it ever happening. What about the cities of refuge? Doesn't seem like that was actually ever put into full force, although that was law. Well, wh- what about the synagogue? The synagogue was completely made up. The Bible has these many, many rules, over 600, about worship and life, and the synagogue wasn't in them. And yet, when Jesus shows up, the synagogue is where most people went for their study, devotion, and worship. Jesus went along too. So did the apostles. Instead of saying, you've added to the word, or this is not authorized, or how dare you, or Nadab and Abihu burning them up. No, this is, this is how you're going to worship. God's going to be there with you. That's stunning it is freeing it's also make makes a lot of people squirm and uncomfortable because they built their comfort upon their system not upon their faith in a living breathing active loving god 
Let's take a look at one example, stunning example, as we wrap this up. It's going to take us a little while. Get the notes in the description box. Print them out because I'm going to refer to a lot of scripture that we do not have time to go to and read. I wish we did, but it would, it would literally take us another hour to work our way through them. The case study I want to give you about community stories not always being what God says, even when they say this is what God said, is a study of the Moabites. I understand that God was protecting his people. The Jewish people had to be protected to bring us Christ. And by the way, I don't think he threw them away afterwards. I think he loves them as much as he loves any of us. And they, I think that we should never, never, never get into that thing where we start believing the Jews used to be God's people, but they're not now. All people are God's people. But he had to protect them so that Christ could be born in Bethlehem when the time was right. But a lot of what he has to say against the Moabites seems well over the top. And if that makes you uncomfortable that I would say that, please, we're allowed to work the scripture. Be a workman, Paul says earlier to Timothy. Learning how to work them, rightly dividing them. Deuteronomy 23, I'll read one of these scriptures. Verses 3 through 6. No Ammonite or Moabite or any of their, des their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, not even in the 10th generation. For they did not come to meet you with bread and water on your way when you came out of Egypt. They hired Balaam, son of Beor, from Pethor and Aram Naharim to pronounce a curse on you. However, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but turn the curse into a blessing for you because of the Lord your God loves you. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them as long as you live. They're right out. They can never come in. No descendant of them can come in. And you may never have a treaty of friendship with any of them, period, because of something that happened way long ago that they didn't give refreshments and much needed food and water as we were traveling through. Does that sound like Jesus to you? Huh. They were unsavable. Moabites, and we're, and we're going to leave out the Ammonites, and then he goes on to Edomites, but we're just going to stay with Moabites for now. They were unsavable and unconvertible. If you had a Moabite ancestor within the last 10 generations, you're barred from the worship of God. And that wasn't a temporary injunction. The laws against marrying a foreign woman are based on God's desire to keep Moabites out of the Israeli bloodline. Ezra chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 13, Deuteronomy chapter 23. And then God repeats his absolute disapproval and condemnation of the Moabites. Once again, men, women, and children born many generations after somebody sinned. This guilt piled on them. You see it in Isaiah chapters 15 and 16. You see it in Jeremiah chapter 14, all the way through chapter 49 verse 6. You see it again in Ezekiel chapter 21 and 25. You even see it in the little book of Zephaniah chapter 2. Ezra was merciless in enforcing these rules when he came upon a large number of families that were intermarried with Moabites and foreigners. He forced them to divorce those wives and shove them and their children out into the desert to fend for themselves. And Ezra considered that to be himself to be a prophet of God, doing God's work. Does that sound like Jesus to you? Can you even imagine the pain of those wives and those children, the broken hearts of the men? Although they went along with it because they kind of forced to. Ezra had swords too. And yet, God keeps telling the story, changing it. And we come upon the story of Ruth, a Moabite woman, who was welcomed, protected, loved, and brought into the family of Israel, the very bloodline of David, the king, and became a grandmother of Jesus, the Messiah. God could not in any way shout louder that these rules about Moabites were not his rules. They were what the community thought were his rules. But his rule of love is greater than, than the law they thought had come from him.
No wonder then that Paul would remind the Corinthians that only three things remain. Only faith, hope, and love. Not all the other edifices we have built around the church and institutions and the rules. Faith, hope, and love. And he says the greatest of these is love. And we can prove it by reading the Bible. The Bible is our story. But we see God break into that story again and again and correct what we thought was right, what we thought he wanted, what we were certain he decreed, and gently moves us toward love and gets our hearts ready for Jesus. And if your heart is open, he is still leading you that direction now. We'll talk more about this in the weeks to come. May God bless you.